Some of you have been given promises by the Lord. And what I'd like to talk to you today about is this, is fight the good fight with the promise that you've been given. And it's in 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 18. I give you a responsibility, Timothy. I'm giving you a charge in the church that you're looking after. He's a young uh, pastor, evangelist, apostle, uh, does many different hats, and he says, according to the prophecies that went before you, and with those words over your life, I want you to fight a good fight. Now, young people, listen to me. In the next few years, you'll have words of prophecy spoken over your life. Others of you have already had them. Some of you are saying, but God's never given me a prophecy. Well, look out. And Paul said to Timothy, when you have been given a promise by God, guess what it's going to involve you in? Warfare. At the moment, we have a world that is trying to be taken over by a force called Islam. And their aim is world domination and a one world caliphate. A caliph is the head poobah. Uh, we have forgotten our history. Back in the days of the Turkish Ottoman Empire, they tried to be the one world caliphate. Go back to 547 and then down through that when Muhammad so-called got a revelation from uh, Allah or from Gabriel or Jibril as they call him and the thing. If anybody, by the way, is interested in finding out more about that, I've got an email from Rod Parsley's book called The Deception of Islam. And it's how he was up in a cave and he heard a voice say to him, recite. A recite, we'd have to translate, uh, was a ranter. Somebody who comes under the influence of hopefully a divine force, more likely a demon spirit, and they just talk. Sometimes gibberish, sometimes they're hopefully communicating something. He said, if you got me wrong, I'm not a reciter. And then he heard the voice say again to him, recite. And he said, you've got me wrong. He knew it was an evil spirit. He could feel its presence in the cave. And suddenly he blacked out. He felt the pressure around his throat. And when he came to, he heard the voice coming out of his own throat and said, I'm Jibril. Take this message and go back and tell the village. He is so frightened, he runs back to his wife, Khadija, his uh, lady of 15 years more age than him, and she says, I don't know what to do. Covers him with a blanket, and he says, don't cover me with a blanket. That's what the reciters do. I don't want to look like one. He goes off to see the Christian holy man who's somewhere down the road, who's a monk who is slightly out of order with his Christian beliefs, and this guy says to him, oh, what you've done, you've heard from God. Take it out. Spared the message. Blessed be he who gave you this writing. And from the very beginning, there's a warfare that's coming from a demonic incursion. He then didn't like the advice that the elders gave him, got a gang of cutthroats, went back to the village and put them to the sword, and those who didn't believe were given the sword or the option of being a slave, dimitude to Islam, or convert and say, there is only one God, Allah, and he does not have a son. And over the temple in the Dome of the Rock, guess what is written right across the top? There is only one God, Allah, and he does not have a son. Now, what does that tell you about that voice? It says that the devil knows what it's like in heaven, and he will deny it to the most absolute. He doesn't want to know about a son who came and died on a cross, went down into Hades, took the keys of death and hell, stripped him of his power, and said, there's a day coming when you'll be thrown into the bottomless pit. I read the last chapter. Anybody else? So if you'd like a copy of that, and there's more on it, what I'd like to draw your attention to, in fact, I'll read it to you, is a prophecy by Jonathan Edwards. Jonathan Edwards was one of the great revivalists that was in the early days of America. By the way, you may not be aware that America was founded, and one of the reasons it was founded and started was Christopher Columbus, a Jew. Did you know Jew he was Jewish? And the Jews were told to get out of Spain. And one of his reasons in going to find the New World, and you're going to hear this in the history books because I don't like the religious side of it, is that he wanted to go there and get the gold and the silver. Now, motives are a bit mixed. Send them back to Queen Isabella and Queen Ferdinand, and you can read it for yourself uh, in this particular one. And he said, I'd like you to use the gold and the silver we bring back and start a new crusade in the Holy Land and take it back from the infidels and the Muslims. Isn't that surprising news? 
you're not going to get told that in the history books if, by the way, you do history at school. And the first battle that American sailors ever fought was the Battle of Tripoli. It wasn't the independence war against the English. They sent a gang of soldiers to try and recapture Christians who had been taken captive by Muslims off the coast of Africa. They had been slaved, uh, put in chains, and they said, you are going down there into the hold until you learn there is only one God whose name is Allah, and you will pay the price for believing in his son Jesus Christ. They were rescued, and the first battle by Americans was to rescue Christians from Islam's slavery. Isn't that interesting? And today they still sing one of the songs uh, for the U.S. Marines about the Battle of Tripoli, and we, we cut our teeth on that particular battle. Now, Jonathan Edwards, who was the founder of one of the, the great awakening movements in uh, America, a lawyer, a man who knew his gospel, and under his uh, ministry, there was the first great awakening in America that brought that nation back to its roots because it was starting to go godless in the second, third generation. And he said, in fact, let me quote it to you. He said, in the last days there shall come a smoke out of the bottomless pit. It is called Mohammedanism. We call it Islam. I'll go with Islam. And America has raised up for this purpose, that it shall defeat that. And in the last great battle before the Lord comes back, the Lord shall see a defeat inflicted on Islam. Isn't that amazing? Now, this guy prophesied this back some two or three hundred years ago. If you'd like a copy of that uh, prophecy by Jonathan Edwards, pop your name on a piece of paper down the front here with your email, and I'll scoot a copy to you. And he prophesied that way back then. Now, I want to talk to you about the power of prophecy. When God wants to do something in your life, the first thing he will do is speak a word over your life. That can be through your parents. It can be through your pastors. It can be through different ministers or preachers. It can be coming in different ways. And the first thing that will happen to it is it will get contested. And if you look over just a little bit further in Timothy, and if you go to 1 Timothy 4, just three chapters over, if you look at verse 14, when Timothy is a young guy and he's going through what all young guys go through, he wants to get fit, he wants to keep a good healthy body, but he's putting too much time into developing the physical and not enough in the spiritual. And Paul says, let's get a little bit of adjustment here, Timothy. You have a greater responsibility than just getting a perfect body. They say that this present generation are narcissists, people in love with themselves. Well, I think that could be said about any generation personally, because Paul said nobody ever yet hates his own body or hates his own flesh, but he wants to save it and look after it. Therefore, look after your wife as well. And... What he said was, when you are getting your balance, this is the balance you should have. Until I come to visit you again, this is verse 13, you give attendance to reading, to exhorting, encouraging, and to teaching good doctrine. A couple of reasons for doing that. A lot of people couldn't read. And secondly, Bibles were as rare as hen's teeth. Why? Because they didn't have the printing press. You either had a scroll or you had a papyrus or... <laughs> In some cases, you might have had it chiseled on bits of rock if you go back 14, 15, 1600 years to Moses. So printing presses and papyrus were very expensive and belonged only to the rich. So he said, one of your duties as a pastor, and it's not quite as onerous today, is read the Word of God. And the other reason that we should obey this is not just because books are now no longer expensive, it's because we've got the books, and guess what a lot of us are not doing? We are not reading and we're not listening to the Word of God. And as I've said before, the first thing I do when I'm up showering and shaving, I put my Bible on, the cassette on CD, and I redeem 20 minutes a day listening to the Word of God. And that's spoken about heart many a time. And this is what he told Timothy. Don't neglect, what? The gift that is in you by the laying on of hands. It was given to you in a prophecy. It was spoken out over your life and it was done with the laying on of hands of the eldership. So meditate on them. Don't just put it aside. When I was just a young pastor here in this church, we drove up to Rockhampton to hear Glenn Foster, a prophetic minister. And I prayed in tongues all the way because I just felt the challenge. 
I want you to touch the heart of God. And so for six hours I drove from Nambour to Rockhampton. I walk in late and he points at me. I've got a blue shirt on, BJ and B1 today. And he points at me. He didn't call me BJ, but he said, you, the young man there in the blue shirt. And he gave a prophecy over this church. And this is dated 1987. And this is what he said. The word of the Lord would come to you and say you're a warrior. You've been in a great battle, and we had just been praying through and slogging our way through to see a church you're established in town. He said, you've suffered loss, but you've suffered the loss of some things, but you've made much gain in the spirit. And sometimes the battle raged morning, noon, and night, and you couldn't even lay down and sleep at night because the spiritual intensity of the battle. And you often got up on a mountain peak, and you looked this way, and you looked that way, and you could see places where there are no battles, and you enemy whispered in your heart and said, turn now, leave, quick, before you're destroyed. But the voice of the Lord said within you, fight on, my son, and you press down the valley into another valley and press the battle down into another valley. And there have been battles in the valleys. It's almost like being violence under blood, and you've had to do things and take a stand. It's literally torn the insides out of you. But you've claimed the land, and you've said, Lord, this is your territory. And it seems like the enemy is trying to reinforce himself and you're not making any progress. But I'm telling you, son, I said, I see me like you're standing on a slick, a skid, a great uh, slippery pan. And you're pushing and the enemy, it doesn't even look like you're moving. But what's happening is as you're taking a stand and claiming the word over your life, you're pushing the enemy off the territory. So he said, stand up and claim it for God. I'm pushing him off your land. I'm pushing him out of your territory. Now, this guy went on for two pages of close type stuff. I couldn't believe how accurate and how spot on it was. Many a time I've taken this out and I've said, Lord, I give it to you. Now, I didn't see all of that fulfilled back in 1983 to 1990, but I'm starting to see it come to pass again now. I've had to wait some 25 to 30 years for the fulfillment of this. Sometimes God will give you a word that is longer than your present time span or concept imagines. Some things only come to pass as you press in and as God works in you the nature of Christ because sometimes you'd be dangerous if God gave you everything first time up. <laughs> if you've lived long enough, you'll understand that. And then he pointed at me once again. He, he, he stopped and he was going to go to prophesy to somebody else and he turned around and he said, I see you writing in a book and you've got an indelible pen and you are making a confession of what God has said to you. Some people say it's naming and claiming, and they slander it, criticizing it, and they knock it. But you are claiming what I've said to you. Now, I didn't even tell my wife, but that was the week I put aside a time to fast and pray and seek God, just a few weeks before this prophecy came. Nobody but me and God knew that I had taken a book, a project book, I bought an art book at school, I had taken it with me because I like to go bush and wait on the Lord and sometimes it gets a bit humid and when you're writing I didn't want the ink to smudge. So you know what I did? I went down to the bookshop, I bought the book and I said give me an indelible pen that won't smudge. Only God knew that. Even my wife didn't know that. And this guy who I've never seen before in my life flew back to the States that night. He points at me and he says I see you writing the word of God in an indelible pen in your book. You can't get much closer than that can you? If I doubted it was from God, that certainly cleared it up. And this is what Paul said to Timothy. You got a word from God. Meditate on it. Reflect on it. And stand with it. When it says, uh, the book of Ephesians, having done all, and you've got the armor of God in your life, word, peace, sword, purity, shoes of peace, take the what? The sword of the Lord the rhema of God, the spoken, quickened word of God. Now, I don't want to give you a Greek lesson, but logos is basically the living word of God that he's given us. Christ is the uh, living logos. The Bible is the actual written logos. But when that word gets quickened to you, it comes alive. And it's that thing that Paul said in the book of Ephesians, if you have a word of God quickened to you, that is the sword of the Spirit that you're going to beat the devil with. And some of you have been facing some incredible battles and the devil is saying to you, turn now before you're destroyed and leave. Man, did I feel the pressure 
when I'd look around at other churches growing and I'd see different people fighting and I'd see miracle of this and miracle of that, and the Lord one day sent Dave Cartledge along here and he said, Paul, you've puzzled in your life. Why don't you see miracles and healings and this kind of thing in your life? He said, you leave that with me. You'll see them at times from different ways and at different places. But he said, I've called you for two things. He said, I see in your life that God has put in you, one, a supernatural wisdom that people want in the kingdom of God. And the second thing he says, I see in you an excellent spirit. And these two things are greatly prized by God. If you can keep a good spirit without being poisoned by bitterness, if you can keep a clear heart that doesn't get twisted by taint of money or power or immorality, he said that's of great price in God's heart and in God's sight. And the second thing he says is the wisdom of God. Do you know what uh, it said in the book of Daniel? There was, uh, I think it's somewhere about chapter 6, there was found in Daniel an excellent spirit. They could not fault him. And if you had to make your great aim in life, I would say have a Christ-like spirit right at the top. And even when you do something wrong unintentionally, or even if you do say or do things wrong, people will still see that they, even sometimes if it's not done right, it comes from a good heart. Now, one would think that Timothy would have got his act together from 1 Timothy to 2 Timothy. Because 1 Timothy is written when he's a young guy establishing the church. 2 Timothy is written when Paul's an old man and he's in jail. And he knows he's only got a few maybe years to live. And so he writes in 2 Timothy, ready to turn to that. 1 Timothy told us what he told Timothy. 2 Timothy says this. 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 6. He's now writing to the young man many, many years later. And this is what he said. Timothy, we're going to look at verse 3 to get the picture. I just thank God for you, Timothy. I remember you. I pray for you night and day. I long to see you. I'm mindful of the tears you cried, the surrender. You know, just a few weeks ago, I saw folk come out here and give their lives to God and answer the call of God. There's nothing like the tears of surrender. The psalmist said, Lord, you've taken all my tears and you've put them in a bottle and you remember them. He said, Timothy, I just love the spirit that is in you. You are my son. I've begotten you in the gospel. And in verse 5, and he said, I remember there's an absolutely honest and genuine unfeigned faith. And you know, it was in your grandmother Lois and it's in your mother Eunice and now I know the same faith is in you. One of the jobs you have as a parent and a grandparent is to watch over the word of God in your children and in your grandchildren. And if this church can go into bat for those words of God over their lives, you will see them preserved for the kingdom. I wonder how much Eunice and Lois prayed over Timothy. Now, we make a bit of a pun about Timothy because he's a, he has a timid character, timid Timothy. Paul sends Titus to Crete because there are a bunch of thugs there and they've got a personality. You've got to be a, uh, a neck like a bull to live in Crete and to stand up against them. But he sends Timothy to where? Corinth, a much more gentle society and to one that he can relate. And so when God sends you to a place, he knows exactly where you should be. And this is what he says to Timothy. I am putting you in remembrance after all of these years... Stir up the gift of God which is in you. It came by the laying on of my hands. When you were a young man and you first came with me on my missionary journeys, I saw this young guy in this church, at, uh, was it uh, Lydia and the whole church around there, and he said, I laid hands on you. I saw you as a young man with potential. And you gave your life to God. I saw the tears of surrender. He said, now, later on in your life, when you were a young man, stir it up. God has not given us the spirit of timidity, but of power and of love and a sound mind. So don't be ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Fabulous verse. You would think that with all of those prophecies over his life, that you'd just bounce into the will of God, wouldn't you? And you'd say, I've had a prophecy from Billy Graham, <laughs> and away you go. But guess what? The devil may not know your future, but I'll tell you what, he will contest it. And I hear in this church, I see and I feel gifts of God in this congregation. You better believe the enemy's going to contest it. 
He tried to do it through Muhammad and he's going to try, they're going to try even harder. So don't be dismayed by that. I won't give a Sunday morning to preaching about Islam. You didn't come here to hear about Islam, but you did come to hear the word of God. And God's in control. Now I'm not going to say it's going to get any easier, and it sure has come a little bit close to our uh, property and our own country, hasn't it? And in just recently, one of my prayer and fasting times, I deliberately asked God would preserve Australia and expose the works of darkness. I tell you what, a lot of people were praying those same things. And two weeks ago, if 800 police hadn't gone in and taken out 56 people, we would have seen beheadings here in Australia. And I see one's just happened over in America. Anybody just see the news? You see, one of the reasons, and I'm going to lay it on you, I'm going to lay it on you, is that Christians have not taken the word of God that God spoke over their life and lived up to it. Did you know that the monk who helped Muhammad put the book of the Quran together and borrow great scads from the uh, unauthorized books of the New Testament and the books of the Old Testament and the Jewish was a monk called Bohira who was cast out of his monastery and guess where his monastery was? in the Golan Heights, and it's in the giant cities of Bashan. Does anybody remember Og, king of Bashan, in the Bible? Ten foot long, bedstead of iron. You can go there today, if you can get in, and you can still see the cities of Bashan, the giant cities of Bashan. They're stretched out across the plain. The doors are ten foot high. The walls are made of stone this thick. The doors are made of stone and the shutters are made. You can pivot them. They're so big that it would take a human being as big as a giant to shift them. This is where all the legends came from. And it's from that very place that the greatest opposition came to Jesus Christ to stop the word of God. And I'll give you a scripture for that in just a moment. And from that place, kicked out of there because he was an Arian and he got his doctrine mixed up about Jesus, they kicked out this monk. It's this monk who sat down and helped write the Quran with Muhammad. Isn't that a sad comment on somebody who should have lived the word of God for his life but got sidetracked into heresy? <laughs> Do you know the other great enemy of Jesus Christ when he's here on earth? He started off very well. He actually didn't want to betray Christ. He thought that he was going to become head poobah and sit at Jesus' left or right hand in the kingdom and be the treasurer. Anybody know who I'm talking about? Judas. He didn't set out to betray Christ, but he sold his soul one piece of gold or silver at a time, and he was a thief, and he put his hands into the offering bag. That's why in this church, when the offering's taken out, he gets put in a bag with a clip. Not because our deacons are thieves, but because we want it to be provided honest, so that you know that somebody isn't doing a bit of a dip in the bag between here and wherever it goes to. And Judas dips his hand into the bag and slowly sells his soul until he starts to hear Jesus saying, I didn't come for this kingdom in this world. I came to talk about another kingdom. And on the very final last day, Jesus says to him one final gesture and he offers him what Steve was talking about this morning. He offers him. And as soon as Judas took the stop, it was night and Satan entered into him. And you have this amazing story of Christ who just said the king of this world, the prince of this world is coming and he's got absolutely nothing in me. And at the other end, you've got Judas who has given his soul to the devil and Satan himself takes possession of him. And you've got absolute darkness and absolute light. Now where do you fit on that scale? I know my choice. I chose for the kingdom of God. When I look at your faces, I see light. I see people who've chosen for the kingdom. But your bet, and if you're a betting Christian, this is one secure bet. If you've had a word from God to serve God, you'll get it contested. And knowing the potential of Judas, Satan slipped up on his blind side and took advantage of his hunger for money. Wouldn't it make a wonderful novel to be a psychiatrist writing a book about Judas Iscariot? Do you know where the word, his surname, comes from? Kerioth. Guess where Kerioth, the town, is? It's at the bottom of the giant cities of Bashan in the Galan Heights. 
the very place that resisted Israel coming into the land with the giants, the very place that produced the betrayer of Jesus Christ, the very place that produced a monk who wrote the Quran, is still under the control of Islam. And they are going to fight and say, there is no son of God. Now, I'd like you to take your Bible, and they say Jesus is a prophet. Well, they obviously haven't read the Gospels. Please take your Bible, and we're going to stitch it together with all of those thoughts with Luke chapter 3. So would you have it open with me, please, because you'll need to lock onto this. In Luke chapter 3, we are now going to see somebody who fought and won, just like you will fight and you will win if you hear the word of God. Luke chapter 3. I want you to notice something amazing about this. John has just been shut up in prison in verse 20 after he's been baptizing. And Jesus is being baptized. We just read it to you this morning. And as he's baptized and praying, the heaven is opened. I want you to imagine you're there. You are a young Israeli boy or girl, or you are an Israeli mum or dad, and you are getting lined up and you would like to get baptized. You suddenly hear, Behold the Lamb of God! And John the baptizer points to him and says, On whom you see the Holy Spirit descending, he is the Son of God. And you watch him go out into the water, and John says, Why should I baptize you? You should baptize me. I know who you are. You're the Son of God. And Jesus said, No, let's do it. This is what I need to do to fulfill all righteousness and show obedience. And he gets baptized. He comes up out of the water, and the Holy Spirit somehow descends in a bodily shape. We don't understand this. And it's like hovers over him and settles over him, and a voice comes from heaven and says, My agapeteo son, you are my unconditionally loved Huios, mature son. You have all the rights of the father. Nothing is held back from your sonship. You are now a mature son. I love you. I have always loved you, and I delight in you. <laughs> and then, Luke, we scratch our head because he interrupts the action. We'd like the lights, the flames, the bullets, the action, the Batmobile, he stops. And guess what Luke does? He sticks in a genealogy. Such and such. And you look at him and go, what on earth is that doing in the middle of the baptism and the temptation? I'll tell you why. In Matthew, when Matthew wrote a genealogy, he starts not with Jesus' mum and dad. Where does Matthew start his genealogy? He goes right back to the beginning, Jesus, the son of God. When you're writing a genealogy for a king, you just go back to the very start of the dynasty. But when you're writing a book about a man, and Luke is writing about a man who's just about to get tempted, he starts with the parents, and then he traces them back. And that's why, stuck here in the middle of this, and sometimes, if somebody would like a little bit of something to do when you've got nothing else to do, I want you to count out how many times the word son <laughs> appears in that chapter 3. Let me know. Text it to me, and I'll thank you for it. And I'm telling you why I'm asking it. Because Luke is inspired by the Holy Spirit to write down an amazing word. This is my son. Now, let's go over one chapter. Chapter 4, he's in the wilderness. He goes under the influence of the Holy Spirit, driven, it says, and led, depending on which way you're looking at it. Forty days, he's tempted. I've done one 40-day fast in my life, and part of that was partial on juice. And when you get to about the 38th day, you feel protein deprivation. You feel genuine hunger coming back into your body. That's a signal to end your fast. And if you aren't a 40-day fast and you're doing 20 days, at about the 18th day, you'll feel protein deprivation coming into your body. And Jesus is at his physically weakest. And guess when the devil attacks you? 
And it says, he was afterward hungered. Well, I read that sometimes and I think, is this an understatement? And Diabolos says to him, by the way, Diabolos, devil, do you know where the word devil comes from? It comes from ball, bellow. What the devil is famous for is throwing things. And the word diabolos means one who throws at you an accusation. And guess where he gets them from? He knows your past. And when he throws you a curveball and you see it coming towards you and it goes, <coughs> there's enough truth in it to rattle you. But I want you to look at what he does here. He throws a curveball at Jesus. Now, what did God just say? You are my son. What is the devil now going to say to Jesus? I'm going to read it to you from the Greek. If son you are, and the first thing he challenges is the word of God over his life. Every prophecy, and I want to tie this back to Timothy, every prophecy over your life will get contested and he'll attack you on your sonship He'll attack you on your morals. He'll attack you on your worthiness. He'll find any curveball he can so he can get it past your bat. And he says, if son thou art. Now the Greek literally means since. This is an established fact. You are the son of God. And we'd be probably better put, he's not questioning if he's so much a son, but he's saying, well, since you're the son, let's see if we can do a few little things here where you can lean on your own independence. Make these stones into bread. Cast yourself at the top of the temple. Prove yourself. Prove your sonship. But Jesus doesn't have to. He just said it's written, and if you're going to beat the devil, you've got to know what's written, and you've got to know what's said over your life. And congregation, I think that rather than giving you a sermon on Islam, I would rather give you a sermon on hear what God has spoken over your life, and then out of that, whenever you come across the path of an Islamist, You'll know what to say and do because you'll know who you are. They're looking. Their life came out of rejection. Islam was born back then in the days of Ishmael, who is a wild man and all his brothers' hands against him and his hand against his brothers. One of the great weaknesses in Islam is this split and fracture that's built in. It's a built-in rejection that's even more fierce than what's in a Christian who's been born again because rejection is part of human nature but you are my beloved son. And I'll tell you what, I spoke to Gerald Rollins, my old friend. I went up and had a bit of a chat about these things to him the other night. And Gerald's up in his 80s now, and an old warrior. And he said, Paul, we used to say when we were in the embassy in Israel, love the Muslim, even if you don't like the Islam teaching. So make a distinction. So I met some Muslim guys up on the lookout over the thing. I went down to their feast of Ramadan. I had a feast in the home with them. I watched them pray, I watched some who were sincere, I watched some who just went through ritual, if I may make that call, and I watched some at the meeting house at Kiwana Community Hall, and 120 of them, they're now trying to buy a mosque in uh, Murchidor. And if God should ever bring you across a path, love the person, and be secure in the fact that God spoke a word over your life, you are my son, and I'm using this generically, ladies, you are my child, and I'm well pleased in you. And when they see that, you can't fight that. There's something in the heart of a person who's demonized that recognize when somebody else is there. I had a client the other day who's way into new age, heavy into occult, and I started talking about Christ. And I could see the person freeze and get really agitated. <laughs> I listened to old Walter Butler telling me one day as he's walking down a plane, and as he walks down the aisle, a lady turns around and looks at him. He sits down in the chair, puts his stuff in the locker. She turns around and she says, oh, are you a medium too? And here's this guy, baptized in the Holy Ghost and a great prophet. This lady, bound in occultism, sensed something in this man that was a strong spiritual force. Now, for him, that was the Holy Spirit of Christ, God. But this medium lady picked up the vibe in the territory. You don't know what's in you. He that is in you is greater than he that's in the world. So when you go somewhere, take that with you. You are a son of God. You're a child of God. 
And when you come across this, don't be so battered and defeated by the enemy that you're worried about it. Live with the power of the Son of God in your life. When you get a hold of, you are my beloved son, and I love you, you'll stop striving and trying to say, God, do you really love me? Am I good enough? You'll just bask in this. I want to give you a closing thought. Preachers are allowed ten conclusions. I'll give you one. <laughs> As I had one preacher once, he said he put his watch on the pulpit and his diary, and he said, I'll use whatever's more appropriate. <laughs> And when the new visitor of the church saw him take out his watch and put it on the pulpit, and she didn't know what hands raised up and what other things were, she said, what does he mean by putting something like that, a watch on the pulpit? They don't do that in the Catholic Church. Well, he said, around here, that doesn't mean a thing, putting his watch on the pulpit. <laughs> I'll tell you about it one day. Here's my one conclusion. Do you not know that angels are ministering spirits, and they are sent to minister to those who are heirs of salvation? Never at any time, this is my opinion, Paul writing Hebrews, never at any time did the author of the Hebrews say anything about all the stuff that all the background of Greeks debating about angels. He just simply said, listen, I'll tell you something about angels. He's never said to an angel at any time, you are my son. He only said that to Jesus Christ. And you being born again, become one of the sons and daughters of God. And angels are ministering spirits sent to minister to you. Do you not know, Paul said, that one day you will judge angels? You didn't know that? Neither did I, but I read the book of Corinthians, so now I know it. I'm not quite sure what it all means. I think one day that we'll stand before God so redeemed, so changed, that what Christ has done in you will make such a contrast to angels who decided against God and rebelled and were kicked out of heaven. But you, in the middle of your sin, in the middle of your rejection, you, in the middle of all the dangers and beatings of your life, have decided to serve God. Is that sonship? And one day God's going to brag on you, and he's going to stand you and he says, the church shall be displayed into the heavenlies as God's triumph. That's you. So don't get hung up and say, I've never seen an angel. I haven't seen an angel. I've been aware of their presence. I haven't seen a demon, but I sure have been aware of their presence. I really don't care too much about that, but I'll tell you what gets me really excited. When I see a son or daughter of God, find out who they are and get changed. You are my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And what makes my life tick, if you haven't already guessed it, is to see a man or a woman find their destiny, answer the call of God in their life, and live as sons and daughters of God. So this week, are you ready for me, Sarah? Do you want to play something beautiful? This week, I want us to live like sons and daughters of God. Stop groveling. Stop saying, God, I'm not good enough. You are a child of God. And when you got baptized, if you could have just seen in the heavenlies around you the number of angels, and when one sinner repents, the angels in heaven rejoice. Are you ready to take a stand as a son or daughter of God? I've given you a lot of stuff. I've tried to illustrate words that have challenged. I've looked at Islam challenging the word of God. But I tell you what, the word over Jesus' life... I've set my king on my holy hill. You shall rule the nations with a rod of iron. That will come to pass. No matter what Satan does, he won't stop that. And no matter what has been promised over your life, Satan cannot stop it if you just grab a hold of your sonship. So stand with me. Let's offer ourselves to the Lord. First, before we pray, we shouldn't ask for something without making sure the slate's clean, should we? You shouldn't put power over the top of sinfulness. If you do that, you're going to have problems later on. It'll bust out somewhere. What we should do first is we should say to the Lord, sorry for selling myself short. I'm sorry that I really haven't grasped the power of being your son and your daughter. You ready to pray? Lord, before we celebrate, 
we do what your word says. We just take anything that is not of you and we put it under the blood. Any fears, any words of darkness, any temptations, and Lord, most of all, forgive us for we have often sold you short and we've not lived up to being sons and daughters of the living God. Help us put our robes back on today, Lord, putting on the crown of righteousness, the robe of righteousness, and the shoes of peace, the ring of authority, and the word of God, which is the sword of the Holy Spirit. Lord, this week, may we wield the sword. May we just live with that power. Now, Lord, I'm asking, this week, sonship will just shine in our hearts. If we come up against a needy person, faith, Islamist, atheist, or whatever, may we be used by the Holy Ghost to speak into their life. Do you know one of my clients sat on the couch the other day, just finished the treatment, we fixed backs and necks, and she said, thank you for what you've said today. My parents were Baptists, and I've got away from it, and I'm not walking with God. And I stopped the treatment, and I said, God must love you very much to send a, a skinny preacher across your path who does orthopractics to remind you that you were made for God. Yeah. That's opened a door, and we've had some wonderful conversations out of that. And there's a person who's walking their way back towards God. Tell you. Are we going to sing and celebrate? All right. Go with God. Have a great week serving the Lord.